Welcome to the Rollwise Podcast. I'm your host, Mike, and I'm here with my good friend, Brent. Say hi, Brent. Hello, everybody. And we're here to continue our dive into Dungeons and Dragons. Um, we appreciate all the listeners who managed to find that first episode, found it informative, told us whether you liked it or didn't like it, um, and told us what we could do better. Uh, but as we are two amateurs on this podcasting journey, uh, we appreciate any and every one of you that uh, come by, say hi, take a little bit of a listen, and give us a little bit of feedback. So uh, since we did last week's overview, uh, we've had a lot to think about with uh, D&D, 5th edition especially, and of course, you know, kind of taking a look at some of the playtest materials um, that came with one d and uh, the new next generation of Dungeons and Dragons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're really kind of uh, excited to talk about that stuff, kind of get through, start meandering some through some of our thoughts, um, and hopefully give you guys some impressions that, uh, you know, help you inform, you know, what your next thoughts are, you know, help you inform about what you can do with D&D and all that kind of stuff. So, Brent, are you ready to jump into uh, some D&D talk again? I am ready to join you on this journey. All right. Well, everyone, uh, you know, since since we're uh, kind of the new kids on the block, it would be really cool if we were the first person that you had ever heard talking about D and D. Um, and so, you know, just to kind of do it a little bit of justice, if you have no idea what D and D is, and this podcast was suggested to you, and you happen to take a listen, uh, I thought we'd go down and break down what is D and D Fifth Edition. Uh, we're not going to necessarily get too much into the settings. That's last episode, but you know, kind of start with what do you need to play D and D Fifth Edition. So, I mean, Brent, bare bones. What do you need to play D and D for Fifth Edition? A uh, collection of dice. Usually, it is the um, like you can buy the packs of dice with the twenty sided, the four sided, the six sided. Uh, primarily, you'll be using the twenty sided. Uh, the others are mostly just for damage. Uh, you'll need the core book, uh, at least the player's handbook. Uh, the GM's guide is helpful. Um, and friends, friends is always good. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Friends is is definitely the understatement because there's been many, uh, many a campaign that has been derailed because of, you know, incompatible scheduling and all those kind of things. So Friends are definitely very important in this entire equation. Um, and they are also the hardest part about the game sometimes. And you don't even need to have these Friends up front. Obviously, you can, you know, use things like, you know, the looking for group and Reddit and all kinds of other websites to to find people locally that might be playing or even online. Uh, you know, that will be Tinder. Really... You can get your D and D friends off Tinder. It, what? <laughs> <laughs> I... Be daring. That's all I'm saying. Just go to Tinder. Uh, well, Just I guess be, if you're be daring, put it in your profile. That's fine. That's fine. Swipe, I... swipe right. If you'd like to play D and D. Hey man, whatever you need to do, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it could work. It, it could. You might you might get a surprising number of hits. I mean, <laughs> since I'm since I'm married, I'm not gonna be the one that tries this out. But I mean, Brent, if you want to for science, <laughs> jump in. For science, uh, I don't think so. I'm the one that said last episode that I don't lead with the fact that I'm a nerd. <laughs> I try and expose that to people later. <laughs> well, you could you could come up with something funny. I mean, like I mean, you just you just have to come up with a name like like the you know, the dungeon master of doom or like <laughs> DM. I think if you, I think if you put dungeon master on your Tinder profile, you're going to get a different type of people. Well, I mean, everybody's into role playing in this. Right? <laughs> so you're at least getting them on the right start. You just have to convince them that the dice <laughs> is the preferred method of resolving conflicts. <laughs> that's really, I think that's really uh, where it needs to go. All right. Well, that's a tangent we can probably, <laughs> you know, I mean, we'll have to, we'll have to explore that one a little bit later. I'm not really, <laughs> It's not really my field, but Brent, it sounds like you have some uh, opinions on it, so we can make that another episode. Uh, okay, Tinder, Tinder, and D and D. We will uh, we'll put that on the on the docket for uh, future episodes. <laughs> Schedule. Uh, don't <laughs> and, and listeners, please don't hold that to us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> don't put our feet to the fire over that one. But um, but yeah. So so in a, if you can't find friends, there are uh, some really good system resources out there that allow you to play solo. Uh, but really, I think we're going to talk about this from like a, a group setting and all that kind of stuff just because that's that's how dungeons and dragons is traditionally played um group size what's your favorite uh group size would you say how many people i prefer playing in a group of like four okay um i would never master or i would oh four plus 
four plus the dungeon master, so five total. Mm-hmm. Um, I would never run a game with more than four, and I would never, as a GM, I would never run a game with more than four ever. Yeah. Ha- have um, you experienced to kind of like reinforce that reasoning? Um, no, I just know that I could get easily lost with, I mean, like there are times where I feel like it could be difficult to guide and give everybody the spotlight when there's like four people. Um, I couldn't imagine having more than that and, um, and just trying to like manage everyone and make sure everybody gets gets their spotlight as they deserve and everything like that. Like that might be something for GM tips someday in an episode, but like, I would not man more than four would just, I think it would ruin me. I think it would be very difficult for me. Yeah. As GM. It's it's not easy. And I can't say that, um, you know, I had, I had one game in which I, I ran, uh, you know, a large group, let's call it. And the large group, um, they, I'd have to say at first it started out with just about four or five people. I can't remember if it was four people that started or if it was five. But um, what happened was is then by word of mouth, you know, friends of friends started coming over and they wanted to play. And so it, it kind of worked, but it is exactly like you said. I mean, ultimately we had, you know, rotating people coming in and out and we had, um, you know, sometimes we had seven or eight people show up for a game night and you just, I mean, you couldn't have a good it wasn't it wasn't an easy game night fortunately the style of game that it was with very much intrigue allowed me to kind of take people off and do stuff with them independently um but and then the other people that were such good friends they kind of like you know they just kind of hung out for a night so it was like a good time to get people hanging out eating food and all those things so in some ways it kind of worked but i I, you also played in a game that had a pretty wide roster didn't you that did have some problems uh, yeah, I had, uh, you know, the game that, you know, the, one of the games I played in, um, it, I wouldn't say it was, I'd say it was, it had, it had problems, but more of the problems were that, you know, you, you spend a lot of time waiting for something to do. And for people that, you know, like to get into, get into a game and actually be kind of action packed and like your expectation is to play for three or four hours. I mean, I mean, I think we had, I think we had upwards 10, 12 people on some nights and it was just, it was hard because you would just kind of sit there and you would just wait for your turn and you might only really get to do one action and it, but may not even be meaningful action. It might be something as simple as going shopping for just telling the, you know, the dungeon master you're going shopping for, to resupply your, your pack. And that was like, oh, that was four hours of my life. Yeah. I can't, I can't even imagine. Like I can't even that would just that's just too much it just i i can't as a player i can't imagine being involved in a game with that many people because like you just feel so i I would feel so like i could just couldn't pay attention to that many that much stuff going on at the same time it would be a lot of it would be a lot of okay what do i need to do when when am i when am i when is my turn just somebody like punch me in the shoulder when i need to do something um because I would just not be able to pay attention. Well, and, um, and then, as, and then as a GM, it would just be like, I couldn't shuffle that many cards. Like I couldn't, yeah. I would never be able to keep up with that. No, it's, it's true. It's true, man. And I think that the tough part about it is, is that especially since, you know, it's easy to get distracted. I'd, I'd say there are people at the table that, you know, especially with, you know, phones and everything like that, you know, it's easy to like pick up your phone, check Facebook, and then miss some key pieces of information. And then, you know, then all of a sudden now you key into it and you're like, oh, whoa, whoa, what, what was happening? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, what, what did I miss? Yeah, you missed half the campaign. Oh, shit. Um, so, yeah. And so I guess speaking about that, you know, because because the, the game that I had was, you know, that was really big recently. And that was that wasn't too long ago. Um, it, you know, it was in person and all that kind of stuff. But what would you say your ideal way to play is? Do you have like a, you know, a pre- do you have like a, a preferred method, you know, in person, you know? online uh i prefer i prefer in person i prefer the post covid um getting my buddies together and playing just because like i said i feel like that's uh uh because it's a social Mm -hmm. it's very much a social thing for me i am more drawn to that but Mm -hmm. in this day and age um uh the internet has made it a lot easier to uh definitely to be able to game with friends far away um yeah 
which I think is, I think has been, has really been a boon for me because, um, in the small town that I live in, um, it's not as easy to find, uh, players or, um, you know, so it's nice to be able to have kind of a core group that I can still be, um, involved in and part of and Mm -hmm. be able to socialize with those people. So I have to say, I, you know, as, as much as, uh, as much as I like playing the remote game is the, is the less, you know, I would, I, I'm okay with it, but I definitely like getting together and being with people, uh, quite a bit more. I found that was always easier for me to like focus on the now, whereas in like, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm a terrible multitasker. And I was like, it was like when I was in work and, you know, you'd be sitting on like a zoom call, you'd be and the, the call was just kind of like, not even tangentially related to your position you would just be doing work you know it's real easy for your your mind to water when you're looking at a computer screen i don't think i, I think it takes a rare person to have the discipline to keep 100 percent focused in those scenarios and maybe that's maybe that's just me misreading it but i feel like if you know my experience on online it can be like it's easy to get distracted or it's easy to miss stuff too i mean it doesn't have to be necessarily distracted but because you don't have any like visual cues necessarily because you're not not everyone's on camera etc cetera, etc cetera. it can be it can be tricky well yeah and but, it, can, it can be hard to get other people to pay attention and like i said it the if if it's you know it's it's very easy to get a lot of people on those and like i said that and i definitely wouldn't want i definitely wouldn't want a big group on a on a remote like yeah. uh because you are just going to have people that never talk. Like they are just going to fade into the background. Um, and I feel like it'll either be a situation where, you know, they're upset that they never get called on. Um, and you're like, well, why don't you say something? Yeah. Um, and pretty much just roll dice when combat starts. Or right. Like and then, and then, you know, you're surprised when they roll dice when combat starts because you're like, Oh, you're still there. Um, you know, that sort of thing. Like, I could just, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't want a, a larger group, um, kind of in a remote setting. I think that would be, oh boy, yeah. Well, and with the, uh, and the other part of that, of course, is that you know, do you like props, like, um, you know, having a virtual tabletop battle maps and all those kind of things, or theater of the mind is your preferred method? Um, I like props. Uh, I don't use them that often. Um. But I do like props uh, more, not necessarily for like combat. Like I'm not, I'm not a big, I'm a big theater of the mind person, more narrative for, um, for combat and kind of stuff like that. But I like props that kind of pulled them into the game. Um, like there was a game that, uh, unfortunately, we played virtually, but there was a game where you, uh, that game where you, the over the edge game where you were playing and um, oh. another friend of mine were playing. Like yeah. I actually had, um, you got an envelope with like, uh, kind of esoteric items in it. Like I think there was like a keychain and some tarot cards and stuff like that. I actually had, like, purchased all of those items to use in yeah. props for those games in the future. And I like giving out prompts to kind of put people in character or make them feel, yeah. you know, to 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 enhance. I feel like props are good for enhancing immersion, not necessarily for like, um, like combat and stuff like that. Um, games that I feel like you need to have a battle mat aren't necessarily my style of game all the time. Um, but I definitely do like, uh, props and things for people to put their, to put their hands on. It's nice to have for people to have things to put their hands on. I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a, uh, a hands-on person. So it's always good to have something like that, that you can touch and kind of bring you into the game when you, when, um, if you feel yourself like you know, sliding out of the game or whatever. It's always nice to have something to pull yourself back in a little bit, something physical. Sure. Yeah, no, those, those are some really good examples. Like, I, I remember that game. Uh, I can't say that we were the best investigators, but I can say that we enjoyed we enjoyed our limited time. Uh, you guys did well uh, with investigating um, because it was pretty freeform. Like, I didn't really have... Um, mm-hmm. It was very open, a very open narrative. Um, and I didn't give you guys a lot of clues, so you guys did a good job, uh, with that, but that was what the, you know, that's, that's like what I like for, for, um, sure. for props, the stuff that, that really enhanced the narrative. Yeah, no, it's, and, uh, I, and I enjoyed it. I think I remember you sending some of that stuff, like, I, th- I think you sent pictures of the props to us. If I, I did. I wound up, yeah. I wound up sending pictures of the props because, um, you guys just, are in different parts of the country. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, I have, and and as for like the virtual tabletop battle maps and all those kind of things, I mean, I I think it, while a physical prop is definitely good, having something that you can reference, and I think that some of the virtual tabletops do a pretty good job where you can like give somebody like a card that kind of has either artwork or a description of what you what you have there. And I'm not the best artist, so like being able to like you know find art that can match that is always very helpful for for those kind of things but you know at the same time you know trying to describe to the best of your ability um i could just feel like the picture's worth a thousand words sometimes and i wasn't really a battle map person but when i'm playing D, i've found that having a battle map is kind of a nice it just it level sets expectations a little bit so even though there's it's a battle map is never perfect you know, I've kind of started liking them a lot more than just doing the theater of the mind stuff, just because it, you know, allows you to, I mean, I hate to say play more tactically, but it allows you to kind of understand space distance, you know, and all that kind of stuff a little bit more. It, unfortunately, like when you do an entire dungeon crawl in a, um, in a battle map, I think that's when it starts to get a little bit tedious where you're just like, okay, well, I move my token here. Therefore, <laughs> You know, now I'm well, now I'm uncovering this like I'm playing like a top down video game and it's Yeah, it's well that's that's the thing is um that's one of the things like we talked about last week in D D is D D is very much um hmm. it's 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 a lot of tactics kind of disguised as not tactics. Um because yeah. they do kind of encourage a theater of the mind play, but when you have things like set distances and stuff like that, um like yeah. we talked last week, like especially like three point five was a big exam big uh, is a good example where they were like like attacks of opportunity. Attacks of opportunity didn't work as well if you didn't have a battle mat because mm-hmm. what like the definition of a five foot move was basically a hundred percent permissive from the DM. It was like, oh yeah, it was a five foot move. You can go ahead and do your thing. Yeah. Um you know, so so and then what if it's not a five foot move? Well then mm-hmm. you know and then you kind of feel like you know maybe the GM's like you know screwing you. Um, yeah. And like I said, I try to do all of my, I I try to do a lot to make sure it's not a, um, an us a me versus them sort of thing. So yeah. So so I think in terms of like you know the basics, what you need to get started. I mean. That's that's I think one of the beauty behind D and D is that if you have zero dollars but you have an internet connection and can get online to D and D Beyond, you can obviously get the basic rules. You know, if you you don't have to run through like any kind of modules or anything like that. But I believe um, I thought the like Lost Minds of Fandelver was like also free on D and D Beyond, so you could hypothetically t- download the basic rules download lost minds of fendelver and you could you know as long i mean you could use a dice roller on like any website you know so you're out zero dollars and you're having a a few weeks of fun depending on how quickly it is as long as somebody decides to make it you know somebody decides to be the dm and all those kind of things now admittedly what's that and the players show up oh yeah and the players decide to show up i mean that you would could, be you a, could run. That, that would be another thing about the uh the idea of having a big game of like six people is the the yeah. herding cats uh ness of running a game that involves getting a bunch of adults in a room virtual or otherwise together yeah. um that can be kind of difficult yeah well and it's it's true i feel like scheduling conflicts are are so many D memes right now that it it obviously can't just be our group that has the problem it's got to be Got to be more people out there. Uh, it is. I believe uh, it is a synonymous problem. Yeah. De- death of many a group is not because of a big bad or anything like that. It's because, you know, s- schedules change. Not everybody can show up all the time. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, and so, you know, kind of getting started super easy, you know, jumping into where you need to be. I think if I think if we look at player advice, if I had if, if you were had never touched Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, uh, or any previous edition. I mean, really, uh, one thing is is that you got to learn the rules a little bit. And I really think you should go at least through the basic rules. Would you agree that, you know, like you should go through that on your own? Or how would you, like, tell somebody? Would you just kind of, like, handhold them that first session? Or what would you do for that new player? Uh, a wise man once said uh, that if you give players homework, um, they will never do it. 
<laughs> um, so I think you should probably t- ask them to kind of see if they can read up on the rules, um, but be ready to have that not actually be something that happens. That would be my, um, that would be my advice for that is, is ask them, Hey, can you guys kind of read the rules? Um, just kind of make sure that we're all on the same page with how everything mm-hmm. works. Uh, and then assume that they are going to ask you a hundred percent for guidance anytime they need to do something. That's true. That's true. And I mean, normally if you had like a session zero or like a character creation session, which I think, I think you should do if you're, you definitely should have a session zero. Yeah. Yeah. Like putting together your characters together else can be good because, you know, I think, I think, you know, you almost cover, uh, you cover like what the first five, six chapters of the basic rules just by going through character creation and yeah. so you don't even have to read the rest of it but sometimes you know if you're interested in like what the game has to offer it's nice to kind of pre-read so you know it, it's like oh i didn't know that class existed because i didn't know to ask you know what i'm saying like it kind of can right. if you at least look through it you can kind of get an idea as to to what exists and i remember fondly opening up phbs to go okay well oh yeah that's pretty cool that's pretty cool and all that well not just that it also um gives you the opportunity to um like I said, you can level set and mm-hmm. you won't get sometimes what I always worry about is again, one of those feel bad moments where it's like, um, I'm such and such. Well, I'm such and such too. And we don't want to play the same class. Like yeah. episode zero is like, it's not a big deal if people play the same class, but if somebody feels like their, um, yeah. their originality or, you know, toes are being stepped on, like yeah. that stuff can be kind of, uh, yeah, that can kind of be avoided by having a yeah. session zero. Oh yeah. Um, and and truthfully, you know, when you have that session zero, I think you can also help the DM know who your character is and like, you know, why they're there because I think, you know, and this and this is something, you know, we talk about a little bit when we talk about like Dungeons and Dragons is a very heavy DM prep. Now, I mean, there are some people that say, you know, you should you sh- you should only really prep as much as you need you think you need to prep and all that stuff but it, you know i mean if you have like a good premise you know for your game you understand the characters you have you know you, at some level you know you try to weave those things together right you don't just want these people that have no connection to what you're trying to do in your game and you don't want your game to have no connection to the people right so right i mean it's it, you know you i think if you have that good session zero and you kind of like work together i think each person can have a reason why they're there and it and the dm you know depending on their skill set can have a have a way to like tie it all together and i think that's very satisfying and i can't say that you know it's always very easy to do and i know recently we've been running a lot of one shot type adventures where it's just like kind of self-contained and all that stuff so it's hard to really kind of invest too much in the character but i'm sure people that have run longer campaigns have you know if there's been any payoff or something that's been in their backstory to whatever right. degree i feel that always is good yeah that is good and i would say the other thing um the other thing that's good about like a session zero is it really gives you the opportunity to find out like you may have an idea for a game like this is my idea and this is kind of what i want to do and then in your session zero, you start realizing that the players aren't necessarily going to want to play that sort of game. Like, yeah. um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is, um, you know, you hear about those weird, weird power combinations, especially in D&D, where, you know, all the players get married um, <laughs> and then in and the, their polygamous marriage and then they you know, have a bonus for a while and then they kill their berserker and then or barbarian and then resurrect him and then do it all over again. If they want to play that type of game, that might be a lot different than if they want to play a game where they're like min maxing and, and coming up with combinations to maximize combat. And you had the idea of like an intrigue game where, you know, there's a lot of narrative. These two situations may run into each other poorly and maybe it's best to reassess what type either either <laughs> assess what type of game you want to play run or kind of gu- guide them to um maybe make characters that are less um choppy choppy yeah no, i have to say that um you know there were definitely 
it, it, there's definitely those those things where sometimes a character comes or like a person comes up with a, a character concept that is just not going to fit, and it's and if you can identify that sooner, it's good. Uh, and not, not to say that people shouldn't explore their imagination and and kind of try to find a character that they want to play, but I think I think the one thing that's always tricky is that you know you have to remind players that it's it's a group activity. Like <laughs> you know you right. might have a situation where you end up with like some sort of main character syndrome and and not realize it, but you know that may not be conducive to group play. Yeah. But, you know, I just I think, think that it's important to know what kind of care, what kind of expectations mm-hmm. the group has of the game because it's easy to run into a situation where the GM starts removing player agency, mm-hmm. um, which player agency means uh, for people less experienced, player agency means like their ability to do things for the yeah. idea of the story that you want to tell, like kidnapping a character. And making it basically so they don't get a play for a while like that's not necessarily good that doesn't feel good and so yeah and so the only other thing that kind of really comes up is just i think you know some of the basic rules and understanding that the only one that's like i mean kind of as part of the character creation that's weird is of course the ability scores now ability scores in D have been pretty static um for the longest time i don't i think the six i think the six stats have always been the six stats um Yep. Have they? I mean, but but there have been variations of those. And so I was going to kind of actually see if you remembered these. But do you remember the comeliness? Um, uh, yeah, that was in DD. That was in first edition. Yeah, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. They had comeliness, which was actually like how pretty. Right. Uh, that got merged into charisma pretty early. Um, and then, so you okay, so remember that one. But do you also remember sub ability scores? Uh, kind of. Um, you mean like eighteen slash such and such? No, no, I don't actually mean that. But like, and this is something we we had picked up because uh, our, a good friend of ours back, you know, he was the one who was buying all the books, and so we, you know, we we were able to get stuff that was it was kind of mechanically, you know, maybe different and all that stuff. But it was back in like player option skills and powers. Do you remember yep. that book? That, yep, that I do remember that. Split strength into stamina and muscle, dex into. Yep, aim and I remember. Balance, yeah, I remember stuff. that. I remember that now. Yeah. Yeah, that was. I mean, it was so weird because, like, I just, I think I remember that being like, well, how can you optimize? You know, using optimize very generously here to create very broken characters because of these, well, these statistics. That was in the last few days of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and I think they were trying to test a lot of stuff before they moved. Yeah. Um to a new edition i think they were really trying to just test as much as they could um and they never they never went back to that like i think that was the only book that was ever in um in those optional rules yeah i think anything anything that was homebrewed about statistics at this point i mean there are some extra statistics they they offer in um i think the dmg like in fifth edition they offer like an honor and sanity stat that you could optionally include and stuff like that so i mean they're, they're just but they're, I don't know how frequently people use those or homebrew or whatever it is. I would, uh, I would say almost never would be my guess. It's a good guess. It's a good guess. Uh, um, and do you have like a, and so to determine your ability scores, you know, the, your, your big six, do you have a favorite way to determine that? Are you a point by standard array? Uh, I prefer point by because I'm terrible at rolling dice. Um, mm-hmm. I will always have the guy that has like four eights in his standard array if I roll dice. Um, and they'll be like, how do you do that? And I'll be like, I'm really bad at this. Um, so I always prefer point by. For D&D anymore, I don't do the point by. What I do is I do the standard array and then just yeah. move the points around how I want because there's only so many. They, they've done all the work for you already. And if as long as you know what the point cost is from their standpoint by, you can start with a standard array. One of the things that I personally don't do, and this is just a player quirk of mine, is I try to start without a stat that is negative. Mm-hmm. Um, because I find <clears throat> I find role-playing a, like, eight of anything is difficult. Yeah. Um, the only time I would do that is if I was going to play kind of a more... Uh, comedy character like if i was going to play a barbarian or a battle rager like eight charisma or eight intelligence or both would be fine with me but that's because that character doesn't do much of anything but headbutt things so 
Fair enough. Fair enough. And so like, and so I guess for people that are maybe not sure how these are used, uh, you know, mechanically, if you have, the, the, you know, the higher the ability score, the bigger the numbers um, that you get to add to your roles when making ability checks, attack rolls and saving throws. Uh, and as Brent was just saying, you know, narratively, I mean, really, you can, you can say that these things kind of are in indications for how your character um, is to be role played. So, you know, I mean, like, it, while strength, I don't really, I, I don't think people have a hard time imagining like a, a high strength character and how that would be role played. But, you know, it, you know, it might need to kind of put your, put yourself in your character's shoes. If you, if you happen to be more naturally charismatic and they have maybe innate charisma, you know, you might have to think, well, how is this person, you know, going to behave differently than I do and kind of try to incorporate that in your role play. I think that's the hardest part, especially for new players is like, you know, not being yourself with just combat statistics in the game. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. And it's really hard. Like, um, like I think I, we, one of the discussions that we had, like mm -hmm. I, as much as I would like to say, I am, I am not a person with, uh, I am not a person with a 18 intelligence. Um, I don't think there's any, any way that that is true, but so like, they're they're going to be you know they're going to think of things that i don't probably um and sometimes role playing that is hard because you're putting yourself in that situation yeah well I, and you know i mean it, and so exactly like i mean how do you how do you role play a person that's on paper smarter than yourself <laughs> right so. or somebody who isn't as smart as yourself and i feel like and i feel like a lot of times when you're trying to make especially the somebody who maybe like a character that maybe not as smart as you are, or maybe comes across as not too bright. Uh, I feel like that could be just easily insulting instead of interesting, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, just, you know, and, and maybe, and maybe that's what your group wants is it wants, you know, easy and, and, you know, stereotype. I'm not judging anybody, but, um, mm -hmm. it isn't just, it's just not something I would want to play. That's fair. That's fair. Um, okay. And I roll and I roll terribly. So as much as I can mitigate minuses is is really just good for me. Like as much as I can stop having like having negative modifiers, like mm -hmm. that's good for me because I am really bad at rolling dice. I, it's OK, man. You know, <laughs> this is a safe space. You can tell us whatever you need to about these dice rolls. That's all I have to say. Uh, you, you've seen the black magic of my dice rolls, so. Oh, I, it's, it's no magic at all. It's just, <laughs> it's just, uh, slight alterations to the dice spot in my chat. <laughs> You'll never succeed again, Brent. Well, uh, I don't think, I don't think you need to do that is the thing. That's what I'm saying is I really don't feel like there needs to be any modification of it. It's just the truth. It's just the truth, but that's okay. You know what? It can't rain every day. I think that's in a movie somewhere. Um, uh, it's, it can't rain all the time, and the movie is The Crow. Is that what it is? Yes. Hmm. Oh, okay. See, I was close. Don't fact you, check me. <laughs> you you were kind of close, uh, but wrong. <laughs> that's fair. Um, so uh, that's I, I, I love The Crow, so you know if you're gonna quote it, quote uh, it right. Okay. Well, I was thinking. Well, is, I think they're coming out with a new movie for The Crow, aren't they? Oh, yes. And you know who's in it? Um, no. I believe Jason Momoa is going to be the new Crow. Oh. Okay. I, I like gonna... Jason Momoa, but I think, I think he seems a little little bulky. For I the... think he's going to uh, crush all of my favorite things, I think. Uh, he already ruined Conan, the new Conan, the, the Conan movie that came out. That wasn't his fault. I'm I'm blaming him for it, but that really wasn't his fault. And he said he didn't like it either. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm a little worried. I think maybe they switch lead actors. I don't think so though. Well, I just I thought I just heard a a whisper that the Crow movie was being rebooted because you know we're in we're in the era of reboots. So that's true. I think I think yeah. that is is definitely on the list. Um, what else? Yeah. And the D and D movie. I don't know if that's a reboot, but we'll see how that goes. Um, all right. So next, uh, you know, from the player perspective, I mean, you're pretty much done, you know, and I think that that's kind of nice about it is that you really, you know, I mean, again, you know, not a lot of necessarily investment and all that kind of stuff. And then once you get through your character creation, now there's some other stuff. I mean, you don't really, 
like they kind of give you suggestions on how to role play and everything like that. Um, but mechanically, I mean, really, you just need to understand how to use your ability scores. And since they simplified it to the D20 system, um, I mean, it's really easy because you just take your modifier in many cases and add those to your checks. So, you know, if somebody asks you to, you know, make a make a wisdom, you know, check and then add your proficiency if you happen to have um, what the hell is that skill? perception um you know you can you know you, you then have a very neat number to roll um you know and, and i think that combat is fairly simple these days you just need to know of course you have to kind of master a little bit of the equipment list and understand what your equipment allows you to do and all those kind of things and and all that stuff but it's really not that bad um from the dm side i really feel like that's where it gets to be the hard stuff um you know i think I have to ask you, like, do you prefer running adventures that are published or making adventures kind of from scratch? Uh, when we talked about this, um, I really tried to think of adventures that I had run from a book. And I have never run a book adventure, actually, um, surprisingly. Uh, so I usually homebrew. Um, I usually homebrew my adventures, uh, any adventures that I run. Um, and one of the reasons is is if i do if i do run a book adventure usually i piece it up pretty pretty thoroughly um because i am i am a strong proponent of saying that whatever plans that you have your players are probably going to mess it up um and i don't feel like most book adventures account for how batshit crazy players are um because your players will do the exact thing that you don't think they're going to do most of the time um you know and we talked about that a little i think in the first episode but like i i i usually like to try and prep i try and prep some i have an idea i usually have an outline um but i also try and be prepared for um exactly the thing that i can't anticipate going wrong to the best mm -hmm. of my ability or not wrong but <laughs> sideways uh um you know trying to get them to zig to when they zag and i just couldn't do it and they decided that they're going to run a brothel now um or or brothel simulator like, yeah or something like that or like the shadow run game where um I assumed my party was all good guys and they were fighting drug dealers and they beat the drug dealers. And then they're like, so we're going to sell these drugs to kids. And I was like, I don't think we can play this game anymore. <laughs> I didn't realize that was, yeah, well, I mean, you can't, you know, sometimes you have those things and people make some weird decisions. Cause you know, as a shadow runner, <laughs> Because I was out. like, I am not, I I am not ready to run drug deal simulator. Sorry, guys. I I appreciate your guys's uh, dedication, but uh, I don't think uh, I don't think I'm ready for that. Yeah, well, it's it's true. Like that's a, I mean, but, but it's just the players just following a chart, you know, or charting out their way. And sometimes, you know, you can definitely roll with the punches, but I don't know how I would have reacted to that either. And and that's and like and sometimes that you know and I could see that being fun and I pro or some parts of it being fun, and then you know I probably could have in the long run steered them off of that maybe that path eventually, but man, it just seemed to be going like it was it was quickly fumbling out of my hands into a place that I didn't feel I was ever going to get it back. Yeah, so. inmates running the prison kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. That's fair. So because I I do have to say that for myself I've definitely run. Um, my own adventures, you know, kind of, you know, that I put together from scratch. Uh, I've tried to do that in settings that I put together from scratch as well as um, all those kind of things. But, you know, I've actually been enjoying running, um, you know, running system, you know, like kind of the whatever system is, especially like 5e. I've been running the uh, adventures from there. And I, I think I like most of them. They're, they definitely, as you said, don't account for all player actions. And so you, you have to kind of be creative and, and kind of be able to, to not railroad people, but also still give people the flexibility to to do what they want to do and, and approach it the way they have to. But I don't think either way is like, I mean, neither, I mean, as long as you're running a game, I mean, who cares if you use a, a module or you use a, 
or use your own homebrew stuff, right? Yeah, as long as as long as the players are having fun. That's what yeah. I always see as the as the uh as the final, you know, judgment is uh if your players are having fun, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter if it's uh a pre-generated uh pre-generated uh scenario or your own scenario. Um as long as as long as everybody's having fun at the table. And that just doesn't mean and I say as long as the players are having fun, but I don't just mean the players. I mean as long as you as the GM is also having fun, because that's the other exactly. thing you have to remember is um I think it's easy to forget that um the GM needs to be having fun too, because if he's not, um you know, it's gonna yeah. be hard running that game. It's gonna be hard running that game. Well, yeah, exactly. Like I mean it I think you know, and that's and that's the thing that, you know, can get can be hard to see because I feel like sometimes the GM can suffer in silence because you guys, because GMs can't exactly just complain to the group and be like, well, I guess they, I guess if you have open communication, you might be able to work through some of those things depending on what's, you know, what the rub is and all that stuff. But I could easily see that being like, well, you guys just suck. I hate how you would approach these right. players. And then, why are you guys so stupid? <laughs> <laughs> then that just it campaign over campaign right. over and then like stomping <laughs> out the door or something exactly um although i did have to i did want to mention one thing that's always interesting about doing like homebrew and all that stuff because you know people have been very creative in how they do things but i have to say that there's kind of like a dm like a dnd mindset that happens and i think it's like this conditioning that that like you know like you see these things and it you know kind of because it's dungeons and dragons right like let's say you know you get attacked by goblins on the side of the road and you trace the goblins back to their lair you know because you the, the, obviously these goblins are you know waylaying people as they're traveling and all that stuff and then you go through and clear this nest of goblins um because you know that's that and it kind of fits a D D s thing and if that sounds familiar that sounds like lost minds of fandelver right well uh, we we were running a game, and there was a variation of that where we didn't realize that these were just you know plucky goblins trying to make their way in the world, and they owned a pizza place basically. And, you know, we accidentally killed everybody in a pizza place, and they were just behind on their payments, so they were making do. So uh, that comes into that uh, you really need to know. Zero. <laughs> yeah, that really comes into that you really need to kind of talk to your players and kind of mention, yeah. hey. Not every goblin you meet is going to be a goblin that you should just ritually murder, um, because that is a that is a D and D trope, it um, is. for good yeah. or bad. Um, it it is, um, and I know a lot of people will dis- potentially disagree with that, um, but it it is. <laughs> um, yeah. it just it just is. I'm sorry. Um that you know goblins are evil and so you can do anything to them you know it's like, it's like consequence free you know fighting and all that stuff and, right. I, and i mean it and i have to say that you know and if your game has those kind of features and stuff like that that's all cool like just again make sure your players know because you know you know we went from feeling like we were the the heroes kind of you know taking care of this nuisance that we're people being waylaid on the road to like you know, we were the villains of the story. You know, we had just murdered a, an innocent family. And you a, just murdered Bob Goblin and his family. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and you're like, whoops. And so, I mean, it just it just was a, a communication error and how we could have approached that and all that stuff. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I remember. I remember you telling me about that game, and yeah, that is. It just it sucked, you know. But you it's not on, good. Obviously. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, Bob Bob Goblin and Bob Goblin's Pizza Place is now a crime scene. Is never. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's just not optimal um no. no and it's and again it's one of those things like i said before it's it's avoiding the feels bad like that's what you're trying to that's what you want to do with your players is you want to make your players enjoy the game but not like you're a different gm than me if you want your players to feel garbagey um yeah. and that's and, and that's that's a surefire way to do it like that's a surefire way mm-hmm. to make players feel not great because what's going to happen is is they're gonna have done this thing and now they're gonna feel feel like you said they they feel like the bad guys 
Yeah. Well, that's, and that's not, and that's not the thing. And it, it admittedly, you know, like, you know, if we went in guns a blazing and not knowing everything, a guns a blazing and not correct, a spells a blazing, I guess. I don't know. Um, you know, that's just, that was more on us. But at the same time, you know, we just, we, it was just a, it was just a miss. Two ships missing in the night, you know, and honestly, you know, that the kind of world that we understood we were now, because uh, opening our eyes up to the kind of world that we knew we were in, we we're like, oh, this is going to be a much more complicated and much more intricate gaming. <laughs> you know but experience like, that we were expecting but, but it's like um i consider it like uh like skyrim right like you know if you go like skyrim sets you up to for everyone to be bad guys because anytime you approach a group they just attack you right and you and it's it's not very long before you're like you you stop saying oh i'm gonna go talk to them mm-hmm. it's it's not very long before that 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 just stops and you just attack anybody you see because you know that unless it's a village, they're probably just going to attack you. And so like, it's easy to get in that mindset with D and D has that mindset too. It's like, mm-hmm. like intrinsically as a role player, um, there's that mindset of, Oh, goblins are all bad in D and D. Like that is just kind of a, a thing. Um, I, I know I know you you don't watch the show, but there's a there's a movie called uh, The Darkness Rising, um, and and they they portray some of the tropes very well. Like they have a girl who's new to role playing, and like the first thing she wants to do is talk to all the all the NPCs in the village, and all the experienced role players are like, "No, we don't need to do that. God, please, no." Um, and she's like, "But but they know something," and he's like, "No, we don't. They don't. Just just keep moving." And then the GM's mad because he's like, "Oh, like all my AP- NPCs are just cutouts," um, and it's like, and that's the that's what you're trying to avoid is like, yeah, that feeling right there. Um, exactly. So, um, yep. yeah. So I think, and I think that you know, as a DM, you know, you're you're pretty much doing the you know, you're doing the give and take, you know, the players are describing what you're doing and, you know, you're, you're trying to react to them. And this is where that prep thing comes back again. You know, it's just like, well, you can't prepare for whatever, you can't prepare dialogue options for every NPC that they're going to meet. So, you know, you have to prepare smartly as to, you know, what kind of things could they find? What kind of things can they do? And how can you react to certain activities they do? I don't know how you'd react if they wanted to start like, you know selling black tar heroin or anything like that but i mean <laughs> well like i said like i said there's a thing you have to decide is this the type of game that you want to play um, oh god if, you guys if, are just so bad at chemistry I don't if know. you're playing <laughs> if your players want to play heisenberg like there's that's a different thing or like if if you have a player saying you're playing a Dragonlance game to kind of tie this mm-hmm. back into D and your player wants to be a death knight like he wants to go down the path of lord soth and become a death knight like i know technically that the minute that that happens they're supposed to not be a player character anymore but if it's an interesting story you could go with it but you have to decide is that the type of game i want to play where i have a exactly cursed and evil player um you know trying to who know and who knows what the and and how and then how disruptive is that with the party like is the party all going to be bad are they all going to be are you are you a party of villainous thralls now and are you ready for them to do villainous thralls um are you doing to do villainous thrall things all the time like you have to decide if that's a game you want to play if it's not then you guys gotta you know you you should talk with your players um and kind of figure that out um you know yeah yeah no it's true and so um and so kind of skipping over to some like mechanic specific stuff i think in 5e you know the nice thing about it is it's you know as we discussed it being the d20 system it's very simple i was curious if you had actually you know heard the term bounded accuracy because that is, seems to be a a fifth edition introduction that I, I don't think i'd actually heard of until i was doing a little bit of reading recently um, it might have just been me missing the boat because i mean honestly when i pick up books i just read the book and go play i don't necessarily like it follow every game designer that's worked on the game and all that stuff on Twitter. I'm no, not, I, I haven't ever heard. Yeah. I haven't ever heard the term bounded accuracy either. Yeah. So uh, it's actually kind of interesting. And one of the conscious design decisions that they made um, was basically to, you know, create a situation in which they stopped the creep. Right. And it, and it's, you know, in fifth edition, they're actually limiting the numerical bonuses that you get on your D 20 rolls so that, you know, 
I mean, that's why you see your proficiency bonus. It really doesn't get very high, even when you're 20th level, right? And so even though you can have things that help you hit, you're never going to see the same power that you would see in um, in previous editions. So like, I think yeah. in I think in like D&D 5th edition, the soft cap for stats is 20. Where I think in like the D&D 5th edition, the soft cap for, you know, statistics is 50 or something. <laughs> You know, well, like, and like in 3.5 and 3, like it was higher than that because you didn't like after a while, it didn't actually matter what it didn't matter what weapon you were using or like what it didn't matter what weapon you were using or like mm -hmm. what uh, armor you were wearing because your stats were so good that um, like it didn't it didn't matter. You were just so good that it didn't matter what mm -hmm. else you were doing. Well, exactly. And that and that was actually kind of funny because I, I had. um. I, I was doing a little bit of reading and stuff like that because I, I, like I said, I hadn't heard the term bounded accuracy, but it makes sense, and I think it's, it's also why they went with the advantage disadvantage route, is because you know when you look at how you give somebody advantage is really if they get if they check a box to get advantage and they you know they basically get advantage for any reason then they get advantage. It's not like advantage is, you know, scaling in any way. Like you don't get d20 plus 6 d6 or something like that you just get right. 2d20 take the best or if you get disadvantage you get 2d20 take the worst and you know it's a, it's much faster than trying to calculate all those things and um, i was actually curious if you had heard about this but have you ever heard the character poon poon or pun pun i don't know how to say it but like it was a it was an optimized build from 3.5 and i think it just kind of ex you know exhibits how 3.5 was silly uh, I've never really been into character optimization, so I kind of don't follow it, that. Well, so was, no, I've never heard of it. It was apparently, and I and I, I'm going to summarize very, very quick. But it was apparently it's pun pun the the mighty cobalt, and and by taking certain things like divine minion, wizard, you know, like a level each of those, and then master of many forms three, uh, they basically could just become a divine being with unlimited statistics right you know like it's just any number like he just because what happens is there was this um this ability that uh it was called like manipulate form and there's some creature called a seric i don't even know what this is it was probably one of the um creatures that existed in the game that you know was in one of the books that i ever read in 3.5 but um they're, they're they can take any scaled one native tutorial and they can um cause an alteration to the creature's body and then of course you know they um can change a minor aspect of the creature or something like that it can also um basically adjust their their stats and so like you can and it can only adjust stats i guess up to what it was but you could basically have your like you could have a familiar bouncing back and forth you know with you to basically you would do something to it and then it would do something to you and your stats would just keep growing and i was like well that's silly as hell. well yeah but i mean i don't know like the the uh, optimization and breaking D, D is such a a mm. trope of the game like it's such a thing of the game yeah. like and we've talked about that like people can say 3.5 is super silly and and like it had a lot of problems but like how many people house rule um creature summoning now because of pixies um from what i understand on the internet quite a few of them because pixies when you the level you can summon pixies as a druid you can summon the pixies and then they they're flying and they can cast all sorts of spells which flying causes problems they can cast all sorts of spells one of which is polymorph other so they can turn your entire party into t-rexes or some other dangerous creature i'm sure uh, T Rexes, I believe, is the the chosen uh, the chosen form for power gaming, apparently, because um, that seems to be the one that I always read about. So like, so like you have this argument where DM, like, where some DMs are like, oh, well, there are no T Rexes in my world, so that can't happen, or they just house rule it out, like you can't do that. Um, yeah. And like, and it comes down to what I always say is like, <laughs> you have to decide is what type of game you want to play because if you if you're going to say no you can't do that you have to have a good reason not just because i don't want it to happen in my opinion because again yeah. you're getting in that realm of just taking away player agency and you have to have a reason for it um i, I don't know no t-rexes in my world is a pretty good reason <laughs> i saw one in a book once 
uh, there's dragons. Why is it hard to imagine dragons with tiny arms and no wings? I saw it in a book once. Like, which, which seeing it is really the only requirement for polymorph, I believe. I thought you had to just like see it in person, not like an artist rendition. I don't think. I don't think you can. I think you can see it in a book. Oh, well, I'd, I'd have to double check that. That's funny though. Um, somebody um, can fact check me and, and hate me for it, but I'm pretty sure that's true. But sure. um, this this time we say go ahead and fact check him. No uh, other time. Oh, well, you can you can fact check me um, and and hate me for it. But um, but like it's, this is one of those D and D things. This is one of those D and D things. Is the game the game can only be balanced so much, um, and after that, it's just kind of ready to be broken. <laughs> um. You know, so and if you want a game where if the you you don't want your players to break it, you kind of got to set that expectation ahead of time. I think. Um, yeah, but I don't know though. I think the um, and while I don't have any hate for the optimization community, those guys are super smart, and they come up with combinations that you're like, what exactly is happening here? Because if you if there's actually a wiki page on the D and D wiki that talks about Putin Putin, and if you try to read that that thing, you're just like, who in the fuck? created this thing and, and why and it was just it was just it was like they they didn't decide you know they know they could create it but they didn't take the time to decide if they should you know that kind of thing well and i guess what i'm saying is is they say 3.5 bad but i'm i'm pretty like, again um there's already people that figured out uh there's headbutt you can turn into a spider and headbutt people for a certain amount of damage and there's already people that decided you can have a polygam polygamist marriage in your party for a certain numerical advantage like this sort of like outside of the box thinking um is what a lot of D D players enjoy. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um it's just a matter of, you know, is that the type of game that you want to play? Um yeah. and and you know, and again, it's 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 about making expectations and maybe saying, Yeah, you guys can do your polygamous marriage thing, but eventually some god may get mad about it and may do something about it. Um, you know, and setting those expectations because you also don't want to say, oh yeah, it's good and then just, you know, knuckle them down for it either because that's not really within the... <laughs> I don't feel like that's, like, again, as a GM you can do... You can Passive destroy, aggressively You can them. destroy a player whenever you want, really. Like, if you hate a character you can just throw threats at that character until they die. Um, you know, if you if and that's if you're trying to be subtle. If you're trying to make a point, you can just be like, "Oh yeah, you get struck by lightning." Yeah, I could only imagine where you're like, "How many? What's the bonus on that polygamous marriage?" Oh, well, that's <laughs> weird. All of our creatures have a natural armor of yeah, like plus two. Yeah, and that's if and that's if you're being totally passive aggressive. Like that's if you're just being a dick. Uh, yeah, well, not a dick. You're just trying to do it subtly. Like if you're try not trying to do it subtly, then it's just like, oh yeah, you're it's a dragon and he doesn't like polygamy. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> he's against it. He, he, uh, he has very strong feelings on this. <laughs> he has, he has very, very strong political and ethical feelings on this. <laughs> um, he's, he's a red, white and blue dragon. And, um, uh, you know, like you could do something like that and just be like, you know, the whole party dies. Like, but you should probably just talk to him about it first. This is more my point. And not just be like, you know, you're doomed and then murder them. Uh, you know, sometimes consequences just happen. I mean, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so with that, what we'll do is we're going to move over to uh, 1D&D. &D. What's that? And that'll be the Rollwise first, uh, that'll be the Rollwise first shirt. Sometimes consequences just happen. <laughs> if we ever get around to making shirts and all that stuff. <laughs> um, I like it. Consequences just happen. Uh, okay, so so with one D and D, um, you're okay with moving over to the next thing. You didn't have any final thoughts about? No, nope. uh, I'll just say like I I uh, I will say this for everyone. Uh, I do bad mouth D and D a lot, uh, but I do I have played it a lot, and I do enjoy it. Uh, the thing to remember is is uh, like anything, it's not perfect. Um, you know that doesn't mean I don't love it because it's what got me into role playing so of course i love it but i do also recognize that it isn't necessarily perfect <laughs> well and as part of our quest we may find the perfect role playing game who knows i don't think the perfect role playing game exists i know you have high hopes for this but um 
I think there are games that are right for what you want to do or what you plan to do, but not necessarily games that are going to be right all the time. That's fair. That's a fair, I think, a fair way to put it. But we yeah, never I, know until we try. I Honestly. think what you're looking, I think what I look for is a game that does what I want it to for the specific game I'm trying to play. It's fair. And maybe we'll even get, maybe we'll have our, our list of categories of what are you trying to do? Here's the game. Who knows? <laughs> Sky is the limit or something. Or whatever. Sky that is weird. the guy. Sky is the guy? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand. But moving uh, on. I'm not, I'm not sure I do either, but, you know. <laughs> we're, we're, we're <laughs> digressing a little bit, so. Indeed. Uh, moving on. So yeah, so let's talk about one D and D. And I think one D and D. I was actually thinking about like what could we talk about with one D and D. And I, I almost feel like the purpose of one D and D's playtest defeats the point of even talking about it. Like, I mean, because there's there's three things that they said, right? They they said they wanted to talk about the D and D rules, and they wanted to take about what they love with fifth edition, update the rules in the game, reflect the feedback that they've heard, and from what the, the game is today, quote unquote. D&D Beyond, they want to make that the platform of choice for your digital D&D collection, content, and tools. And then they want to involve a D&D digital play experience. It's an early development that D&D Digital will offer immersive player experience, rich creation tools for dungeon masters, and a connected space for DMs and players to get together and play D&D. So the problem that I have is, is the more I read, because I read through the rules pretty well, um, or I should say the Unearthed Arcana, that, you know, and it's there. And I just, I mean... I don't know what to say. Like, I feel like the backgrounds were fine and I feel like the, the marshals or, or the, sorry, the experts are fine, but it's like, you're just, you're seeing this stuff in a vacuum and it's, I mean, you know that they're going to go to that, that. I mean, this is going to be D and D 5.5, but it's like, it's almost like you almost hate to like get really attached to these changes because you don't know if, if your feedback, how much your feedback is going to impact it. Because, you know, I think when you went from the Unearthed Arcana character backgrounds to the Unearthed Arcana um, experts, I mean, they had already said that based on their own internal testing, they they took and made changes to the the rules glossary. And so it's like, I mean, so how much, how much you know, influence did the actual, the 40,000 people that filled out surveys had on that? None. Right. Like, <laughs> what is real? Yeah, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I... Again, I strongly feel like it's not a play test and it's a scream test. I strongly feel like it's a, is there anything that we might do that's really going to piss people off? Um, because again, they don't want to, they don't want to split their market share like they did with Pathfinder. Like they don't want to ever make that faux pas again where, um, oh God, <laughs> um, you know, half of our half of our players went to this other game because it was more it was more like what they were used to. Like I think that's and that I and I strongly feel that way. I feel like this is not a play test. This is a scream test. This is to see this is to see if anything that they're doing um upsets the community to the point where they want to leave. Well, um and I and I feel like and I think that's and I think that's the purpose of the I also think that's the purpose of the um, of the survey, because, you know, the vocal minority is always going to be vocal. Um, and they can kind of weed that out from people filling out the survey, I think. You think so? I mean, I, I guess I have two things that I've seen, you know, and this is and this is the hard part is that, like, I mean, how many D&D players actually troll on the, the RPG subreddit or D&D subreddits, you know, that are there? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot, but I mean, if, if you go to, you know, wizards and you say, well, how many people play D and D if they're saying 50 billion, you know, like they played D and D in 2020 or 2021 or whatever it was. It's like, I mean, you got 40,000 people that filled out that survey. I mean, I mean what? <laughs> that's, that's well, not so, it. so, so I guess, I guess that is, that is the question is really honestly doesn't matter at all. I, and that's my point. I don't know. I'm almost, I mean, to your, to your screen test thing, it's just like, I, you know, I, are they making people mad? I mean, I've been on the forums on Reddit and, you know, I've been on those specific subreddits and they have, you know, and I, and it's weird though, because I feel like, you know, the people that are going through this and I, and I never really had thought about D and D in this world in this way, but like, um, 
you know, I, I guess the new, the thing that's common for people to do is they talk about DPR, you know, damage per round. I I suspect I'm just not that kind of gamer, so I really don't. Well, yeah, because it's not a video because it's not a video game. But it seems like somehow video game mentality has invaded, and then and and everyone has to have some sort of equity, in, or, you know, in this entire thing. And so, like, I, I don't know if the DPR people are basically saying, "Oh no, now the DPR of the the rogues, for example, is so low that." you know, mathematically, they're not worth playing. And it's like, you know, I never really got into D&D to mathematically play a character, I guess. I mean, I do think that, you know, because D&D has an emphasis on combat solutions in many cases, you know, you don't you don't go negotiate with the dragon every time, right? You go fight right. the dragon, <laughs> um, right. you know. So, I mean, having a good DPR can influence how those those out, the, those things are that are, are i guess those those fights come out but i mean at the same time i mean i you know i don't play a role-playing game just to you know boost the number regardless of how it feels I i like to feel if the character is is fun to play in the world and all that stuff and i don't necessarily entirely base it on just the combat of the game so but that's but that's uh that's why i always kind of argue about D D is because that is such a large part of the game Mm -hmm. There are people that will, um, and it is important. Um, combat being what it is in D and D, there are people that are that that's what they're going to, that's what they're going to key on. Um, and you know, it takes a very special player in D and D to to, I think, to pick something suboptimal because what's going to happen is is, you know, you can always role play, like you can always talk to people. Um, whether or not it's, it's, you know, it's supported by like skills or whatever, like you always can, you're always going to have the option to talk to somebody. And a lot of times good role-playing will like the GM will reward good role-playing. Whereas if you suck at combat, you're just going to be stuck doing combat. That's not fun. Um, so people are always, I think, I think, I think that's kind of where this, this idea comes from is that optimization matters and i'm not that type of person either i'm i've never once thought about how much damage per round do i do unless i was playing a video game like there's well even in video games like even god i was even in like wow and stuff like that i was always bad at that but but that's the thing is i'm not that type of player either so it's not yeah. something that i would think about um yeah. and i think and i think again like you really need to think hard about what type of game you want to play. Like mm -hmm. if you want to play a game where that's important and I, there's probably GMs that love running games that are um, hyper focused on tactical combat. Like, mm -hmm. but I'm, I am not one of the, I'm, I'm not one of those. And so it's hard for me to imagine what it's hard for me to imagine what that's, what that type of game is like. Yeah. So I think, you know, and I think that that, and, I, and I'm not going to say that, you know, that's necessarily how it's going to come off, but I just wonder how do you, how do you kind of like take that into consideration, you know, for these people? Because as you say, you know, it's the vocal minority. I mean, they, you know, these people are like, pretty much the sky is falling now that rogues are some somewhat suboptimal and now they're getting sub suboptimal to them. You know what I'm saying? And I, cool. and I mean, I don't even know. And the know thing how. is, is, and the funny thing is, is they're saying it's suboptimal based on not everything that's in like well, exactly. they're saying it's suboptimal based on like limited information one of the things that i think and this is kind of goes along with which thing is which is funny i guess because um there's a couple channels on on um on youtube in different places um that have been talking about this because their bread and butter is D D, and they you know they podcast about it and they mm -hmm. talk about builds and do real plays and stuff like that and one of the things that they mentioned, one of the ones that I watched mentioned was the concern for power creep, like characters getting more powerful, which I always thought, which struck me as odd because like D&D, &D, and you can argue with me because one person that I talked to about this did, um, but D&D is not like a competitive game. Like I always took power creep to mean that like one, one person or one thing is going to dominate everything and it's not a competitive game like i guess i guess the concern is that one one like are you really worried that your party of all bards is going to be overpowered like is that really the concern 
um i i don't understand what power creep means in in terms of D D. um which is also funny because you're saying that they're saying that a lot of the voices are saying you know we've been nerfed um which is also wow. funny to me well and and i i think that you know without having all the information people are going to draw whatever conclusions they can and in this case all they really can do is they can take the you know the feats and everything like that that they got in the expert class see how that applies to marshals or whatever and then then i think what the consensus that i was kind of getting from what i read and i don't i mean this could be like the the tides you know depending on which subreddit you you're you're yeah. in and depending on who you're talking to you know there might be people that are like oh my god i love the i love the change because it seemed like people were really the happiest about the the ranger changes you know flavor wise and everything like that and i have to agree i kind of admit that you know like i did like the favorite enemy mechanic i also have to admit that like that was really limiting to rangers you know so kind of having the the new hunter's mark and everything like that be kind of a mechanic that they use to show that they study their opponent and get some sort of damage advantage and all those kind of things um was interesting but you know then bards were kind of in the middle people were kind of still i think chewing on what that on what those changes meant and everything there was a lot of people that were kind of not happy with how the bardic um inspiration changed and how the font changed and all that stuff because i think um the bardic you know the bardic inspiration it went and it now went up to uh seventh level or something like that that meant they had a lot of levels where they had to wait till long rests to get their um to get their bardic inspiration back but at the same time now their bardic inspiration is a reaction so rather than having to just you know waste bardic inspiration on you know somebody and hope they remember it sometime <laughs> you know right. they actually get to you know kind of use it more surgically and i think that was a, a pretty good move so i i just i think in seeing how it plays out that's going to be the hardest part is because i mean it, it's hard to include these new classes and then sell the old, I mean, what group is going to be like, okay, well, you get to now change the rule of your bard because you have a 10th level bard with us. You get to now use the UA version of that bard and we'll just see what happens. Well, yeah, that's not going to happen. Like, yeah. there is no way to play test these rules, really. Um, not easily, like, or at least not that, in a way that I think you can really understand. Like, how and, that, and, that, and that's more my point. That was what I said when the character, like, when we talked about, you know, playing the game with these rules and, like, at the time we talked about that all it was was the um all it was was the uh the character backgrounds um and it's like well we can make characters <laughs> like like what 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 are we testing um because there's nothing here to test really mm -hmm. um and that's why i say that's that's why i keep using the term scream test because um the fact is, is it's, it's not, you can't, it would be like saying, say you made a, like, you made a video game. It would be like releasing one class and one level of the game. Like, it's the first three steps of Elden Ring. Tell us what you think. Mm -hmm. does, does the game seem balanced? You seem like you can kill things. You seem like it's fair. Well, there's only one guy here. Like, I can't, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and and you're like perfect perfect that's perfect that's thank exactly you for the feedback thank you for the feedback and you're like what what just happened like what what feedback i didn't i didn't say anything thank you um it's just very it's weird because it's and i hate to say it this way but it's a very it's very kind of corporate i guess it's very kind of like hmm, hmm thank you for your thoughts when they really don't care about your thoughts um well. <laughs> so that's my whole thing is like it's very it feels very weird in that in that in that aspect of um of it to me um mm -hmm. but you know what do i know yeah i mean oh well, we're just we're just two guys on a on a journey together through the 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 wasteland of role-playing games what so. i was uh what i was very surprised by was my feeling that um upon reading the classes yeah was just how samey it really is gonna feel like mm -hmm. it's just like oh no it's just still gonna be D. &D. yeah i mean it, it i again it, you know that i think it's gonna go 5.5 and i don't and i think the people that were like oh this is gonna be a whole new edition i mean there there may be enough changes to really warrant that but it feels like all they did is kind of shuffle things around a little bit and they're not even done shuffling 
mean, at the end of this, you know, this could be like one of those shell games where, you know, the the whatever the the trinket is on the right side, and then it ends up right back at the right side after. Ha! We got gotcha. you. Two years of people, you know, constantly talking about D and D. So, I mean, this is—is is this one of those things where it's just like, you know, people just want to be talked about? Any, any? Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Mentions. It's a scream. It's it's a scream test, and a exactly that. It's yeah. Press. It's press for the game because what's going to happen? My prediction is the game will yeah, come we'll out. To this, a bunch of people will buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people will be unhappy and talk about it, mm-hmm. but they still bought the stupid game. Uh, a lot of people will love it and they will all have bought the game. Uh, bottom line is a lot of people are going to buy the game yeah. and that's really what this is about is about, it's about making sure people buy the game and they can kind of, and they can kind of measure Again, I really don't think they want what happened with 5e to happen or 3e or the transition to 4. They don't want that to happen again where somebody says, "Well, you can't really copyright rules." Mm-hmm. So, I'm going to go just take your rule set, make make my own game and we're going to use 3 3 and 3.5. Wow. Um and we're going to and we're going to split your customer base. Like that's True. that's that's really probably what this is about is they really don't want that to happen again, I think. Yeah, well, and like, I mean, it's it's actually kind of interesting because you know, like, I, if fourth edition is any indication, I I know you played a lot of it, but I only bought the first three books. You know, I bought a collector set because I was like, ooh, the new edition, and then that was all that collected dust on my shelf for. Man, you know, I bought. I think one. I think I have three versions of the core, of the three books downstairs because people left them at my house. Or just like, um, there's just like, yeah, we don't need this anymore. Um, so I think I have like three copies of that. And then I think I have, um, I bought the Psionics and the Primal books. Okay. Uh, I bought the D and I bought, I of course bought the Dark Sun books, mm-hmm. um, which is fine, which is fine. Cause I still use the Dark Sun books. Cause actually the, the lore stuff in it is, is still okay. Um, there's some things in it that I hate to the core of my being, um, because they're very, they're very, um, you know, uh, <laughs> they're very fourth edition like there's literal like there's stats for all of the dragon king or the sorcerer kings mm-hmm. um which i feel like is weird but weird and <laughs> like well because they because in, in 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 four they were like a final boss like they weren't they weren't the special thing that they were in any other edition they were just kind of like the final boss um which if you know me hate that i hate that um but anyways um so you know but some of the lore is good like some of where they took the took the the background fluff is good so i have that um i have a couple other ones but i have quite a few i really have i i I have a problem with buying books and so um i have quite a few of them uh but they're not they're never but like so i think we talked about this too um, like I have a lot of the second edition um, books still. Like we talked about the 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 was it the one of the handbooks? You talked about one of the handbooks, and like I went downstairs and I have all twenty of them, like all twenty of the brown books from yeah. Andy the second edition, and I still open them sometimes. I look at them to read fluff and stuff like that. Like I have a copy of the villains, the one of the blue books, the villains mm-hmm. handbook that I read often because it has really good tips on how to make villains for games. Nothing in third edition, like there is nothing, none of the books in third edition besides the dark sun books that I have ever opened again since the game stopped. Um, because there's no reason fourth edition, fourth edition. I'm sorry, because there's no reason to look at them because the game just doesn't, it just doesn't, it just doesn't, it didn't have it, whatever it is you want to, you want to think it is, it just doesn't, it just doesn't yeah. have it. Um, yeah. It just failed on some level to connect where I think it's important for D and D connect to connect. All right. At least for you. I mean, there's, there's at least for me. And I think it did for a lot of, but I think it, I think it did for a lot of people um, yeah. because a lot of people, while people love it in retrospect, um, there is a lot of people that have come to love it in retrospect, because I think there are, there are things that are good in it. Like mm. if you want balanced scenarios and you want class balance, 
it's the best D and D game for class balance because all the classes are essentially the same. Um, you know, they're and the things that they do are kind of just particle effects. Um, yeah. you know, shiny stuff. So, well, so I guess in that, in that term, because there, there's the buying book thing, you know, they're going to talk about D and D beyond a lot. And I know that wizards has, you know, they've set up, you know, kind of a, you know, a schedule of books to be released and everything along those lines. And I have already, you know, pre-ordered the, um, the dragon Lance, uh, the, the dragon Lance books coming out, I think at the end of this year, I of course got the alternate cover, you know, because it had thought on it that, and that, I mean, it just looks absolutely beautiful. So you, even if it's just a really pretty book that goes on my shelf that I look at the art for once in a while, like I'll, I'll enjoy that art. It's really good. Um, but you know, with D and D Beyond, I mean, I've I'm curious because I don't. I mean, D and D Beyond is like not an optimal experience for me. I mean, when I go on there, it doesn't seem to load very quickly. It doesn't. You know, I'm just wondering, like, does it does it happen to you like that, or? Uh, I don't use it very much, and I think I, I told you this before, but really, what I like about D and D Beyond is just being able to get on it and make, like make a character. Yeah, I, I definitely do that too. I, you know, I do that as well. And I have a, a, you know, an adventure that I was setting up and I was making some pre-generated characters and its ability to just create random characters is kind of fun. You know, I can pump out yeah, a few of those. Exactly. Um, but I've never, I've never used any of the adventure stuff. But I, I mean, honestly, if they want D&D Beyond to be like this kind of sticky end all place where you do everything on it, I think they got to make some make some improvements to the website just because like if i want to go to the dungeon master guide i mean every other website i go to you know i've got great internet where i live i've got a, a reasonably I, good laptop and it takes way too long i to also load. it's very hard to find things like i did notice i have noticed that on multiple occasions where it's it's awful difficult to like you can't just search for stuff it doesn't seem yeah. um and, which i find extremely frustrating like that is the most frustrating thing to me is when i can't find something on a website um yeah especially one that requires you to leaf through it as much as like running a game is or, or making a character like there's things that you need to look at um and so it should be easy to find those things well and uh, you know you'd think that this would be something simple but like if you go to like a book and let's say you're just using like the dungeon master's guide unless I'm just totally missing it somewhere, you, you know, you don't, you can't just be on the book as a source and then search within that book. You have to search the entire website right. for, for then. And then you, you can filter after that point, but it's just, it's like, why not just, if you're already in the book, why don't you just search the book? You know, like, <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, it's, just, it's just like it, like I have to go and do search everything right out of the gate. I just, unless I'm not using the website correctly or something like that, and maybe there's a way to do it, but I just, I haven't found any easy way. And so obviously because my experience is the experience of the average user, um, I don't consider myself better or worse than them. I would say that, you know, other people have probably found there to be, challenges with this too and the other thing is is that because most of the cool people that are nice enough to respond to you when you have like like rules questions or hey where do you find this in the the dmg if they have the book and you have the the dnd beyond thing they tend to give you page numbers and you have mm -hmm. nothing you can do with that you're just like right. okay well well what what topic or subtopic should i be <laughs> right well i'm i'm i mean i think it'll i, I was gonna say i hope but i really don't care um, I think it's going to, they're probably going to have to redesign the website, I think. Um, yeah. Which I think is probably going to be part of this release. Um, it could be. Yeah. Because, again, I'm fairly certain that uh, the books that they say are going to be reverse compatible are going to be not as reverse compatible as they want you to think. Maybe. Well, and I think, I think it, you know, it's called out that, you know, since D&D is fairly, you know, there's, I mean, there's definitely stuff that you have to change if you do any any adventure, but you can go back in time and do any adventure from any edition. You just have it just depends on how much effort you put into it. Like three I think three five to five, I think if you wanted to take any of the adventures from that, you know, that edition, you could probably with some work do it. But if you wanted to take four and go to five, I think I think they actually had like like charts and stuff that you know. Yeah, there's a there was a there was a conversion. They did a they did a conversion thing, but I mean, bottom line, like you can play any adventure you want. I mean, you could play a Call of Cthulhu adventure in D and D if you really wanted to try it. 
yeah. um, whether or not it works. I mean, I'm not suggesting it, please. Um, yeah. uh, whether or not it works, like, but you could do it. Like, you could stat it and and figure it out. But you would have to do more. Yeah, you'd have to do more work. Um, yeah. It's not. I don't think it's going to be this plug and play. <laughs> this plug and play thing that they kind of allude to where it's like mm, this is going to be really easy i just don't yeah um that screams marketing ploy to me just like well and it'll it be just interesting screams yeah you'll just be able to just take the thing and do the thing and you'll have a thing and it's like well that's probably true but not true to the point that you meant it uh, they're um, just hand waving us with the six. But you know what? Also, Brent, if there's no effort, there's no reward. Even as the GM, you got to put that elbow grease in. You're right. Yeah. I don't even know how to respond to that. Just kidding. Um, but I do no have to effort, say that there's no reward if you're not working your ass off. <laughs> uh, get better. Get good scrub. Um, I, get I'm good just kidding. scrub. Indeed, get good scrub. That's that's all the GM advice we have for today. <laughs> and that's that's where that's where we're done. No, I was kidding. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to mention that they uh, they do have some. I mean, they have some tools that they've been putting out. You know, like they have the encounter builder, which allows you to like you know build the encounter, manage initiative, and do all that kind of stuff with it. So you can you can at least know based on the encounter summary how difficult your encounter is going to be for your average party level and all those kind of things. And I don't know, like the adventuring day is kind of a weird thing. Um, do you know that? Have you heard that term from the DMG? Like, uh -oh. so like the adventuring day in D and D is like, um, you know, you basically, this is, this is what you want your characters to do between rests, like long rests specifically. And assuming that you don't use like the variations of rest, like heroic rest or, um, gritty realism kind of thing where, you know, a long rest is actually a week or something like that. Um, you know, the the idea is is that, you know, this is what your daily budget is. And so if you have five fifth or four fifth level characters, your daily budget's fourteen or fourteen thousand experience. And so this helps you build those kind of combat encounters to kind of help you with your daily budget. Now, I think that if you look at it like I mean, if you just think of your daily budget being like six to eight normal encounters, you can, of course, make them more deadly or less deadly. But I think it's kind of weird because, you know, it doesn't really have, like, traps listed or anything. Like, you know, so, oh, yeah. So it's like, I mean, it's, I think the, like, the the daily budget that you have can be a little bit wonky. And I don't know how well it fits because, like, I mean, if you're doing overland travel, I mean, every day you, you like, bed down to rest your characters get a long rest, especially things like elves that only take four hours, right? They get a long rest. All their stuff is supposed to be restored. So are you supposed to have six to eight encounters in that scenario? No. You know, and if they do have a random encounter, what's to prevent them from going, you know, full, you know, pedal to the metal, use all their special abilities, knowing that there's nothing that they have to worry about. Right. <laughs> and then rest and then rest again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little, it's a little bit weird. Oh, uh, well, that's, that, oh, that's always been a weird. Yeah. That's always been sort of weird. Like, like technically, like I always struggled with the fact that you're in a dungeon, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you're going to find a place to lay down in the dungeon. But yeah. Just, yeah. Just... That seems weird to me. Um, sort of like people, uh, you know, making out in horror movies. Oh, this house is haunted by a guy that wants to peel our skin off. Uh, I think it's time to, uh, to have a tryst. I don't, I th I think those are weird, weird, weird things. I think those are weird things when you're in a dangerous situation. I mean, no better time, really, right? <laughs> look, look, I mean, it, it always works. Obviously, they make it to the end of the movie, don't they? Uh, well, no, because, you know, that's against the rules. But um, you, you don't, you don't, you don't have sex in horror movies. Uh, that'll, that'll get you killed. Maybe. It's against the rule. It's against the rule. Uh, but like, yeah, so there's, there's always that sort of thing where it's like, oh, this, this dungeon, it's not a cave, it's a dungeon, but we're going to find a place where we want to bed down for the night. Oh, okay. I guess. Yeah. 
makes sense to me. Obviously, there's going to be no random wandering monsters or anything like that. Just Right, honestly, yeah. there's no jailer or anything that's going to come by in this dungeon that you have. Um, you know, sure. sure. Um, so. so, so yeah, so that's, it's just the encounter summary. So it does have tools like that that help you build some of those in. And I mean, you know, at least it gives you like a reference point because I, I already think that challenge rating and stuff like that is not great because you can obviously you know challenge rating can be a little bit manipulative and and um you know you can have a, a really low challenge rating thing or you can have a really high challenge rating thing and they just neither one of them provide the challenge that you expect to the party sometimes you might be too hard too easy right. you just hope that you find a good balance and that's where i think the you know i mean even though you get a little bit of help you still have a lot of work to do on the back end well i but, think um, i think that's one of the i think and a man i could be demonized for this but i think that's why why they're discussing removing crits from monsters is like uh that's hard to balance like if a monster can crit and just murder your party um it's hard to decide it's hard to say like this is a this is a set cr for this monster unless they re unless they roll really well um that's just not easy to it's not easy to balance it blow your mind away. They just do. Um, and I think, so I guess with that said, uh, last last uh, pillar here, the digital play experience. I mean, as I said earlier, I like the virtual tabletop thing. When I saw it, I saw the um, Unreal Engine look quite pretty. Um, the tilt shift thing to make it look like you were looking down at like a three-dimensional game board, I guess. I don't know. Um, I think that's, I mean, it, it looks nice, but I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like at some level, you know, even with the tilt shift camera, I don't feel like I'm not jumping into a game of Baldur's Gate. <laughs> you know, like. uh, well, you you will be. I think it's I think it's one of those things that it is going to feel like it is going to feel like a video game. Yeah. Uh, and I think they're going to have a real hard time not. I think it's going to be hard for them not making it feel that way. Um, because. Yeah, it's just it's just going to feel like a video game. Um, and I think the only thing that's going to be really tricky is that this could easily be how they make all their money, you know? So they're like, well, what's your, you know, what's your strategy for making money if you're not putting out new additions every eight years? And they're like, well, people want to customize their characters. And so we're going to sell them cosmetics or, you know, character builder, you know, where they pay for pay for the the final character to be used in the game or something you know what i'm saying or something like that yeah or character slots they already have that where uh yeah. where um the character slots like how many characters you have access to make mm -hmm. they already have that so yeah. yeah and so i think that they, there's part of there's part of me that doesn't think that they're going to be like making this for um you know, just just for the benefit of the players, there's got to be some way that they make money out of this. No, they're going to have a monthly subscription. I mean, they already have a monthly subscription, but um, you'll probably get more for that. Maybe, I mean, maybe you'll get more for that monthly subscription, and it'll, they'll provide things to make it more sticky. But yeah, they're gonna yeah they're gonna have to do something like that. Um, assuredly. Out of curiosity, what what's your number? Like if if they said you get access to everything on D and D Beyond, and that includes the virtual tabletop um all the published adventures and everything like that what what's your number like what would you pay per month to uh for D D? yeah uh i would probably play a different game <laughs> no, no number <laughs> uh no i don't well i'm not playing for D D beyond now i'm not playing i'm not i'm not uh i'm not paying for D D beyond now and there's things that i like about D D beyond D D beyond now but um i don't if it uh, if they lock something like that behind a paywall and I, I just necessarily a paywall but an a, an I, alternative option to subscribe you know, i just subscribe don't for at content access i just don't see it i don't see it as something i would be that interested in like <laughs> there are other games um and there are other games that i probably like more than D D. um and i would just focus more on those games That's so fair. maybe i maybe i'm not the guy to ask how about Apparently you? What, Brent, Brent is what, zero dollars. What, what, what's me for free? What's um, uh? What's your number? Well, I mean, I play enough D and D, and I go on D and D Beyond. I mean, I feel like you know, with my dis with my budget and discretion and all that stuff, if everything was there, I mean, 
constant constant tools and all that stuff and if we were playing a game you know four times a month maybe i'd probably pay 15 20 bucks a month to have access to everything i know that's not how it's going to be obviously but um i mean it could be i mean it's, I it's mean, hard it to, it's hard to, it's hard to say but um, i think 15 20 bucks is not too hard for me to spend on my hobby i spend i mean how much do i spend on spotify and netflix and all that other stupid shit that i barely use sometimes well yeah no i mean and i'm not saying there's not a market for it i'm just saying i might not be the market i might not be the market for it you are not um how much would you pay and you're like i don't see i don't see zero on your list (laughs) for D &D? i don't know um you buy all these books man i mean god you gotta gotta i am yeah i am not like I said, I'm not that interested in the I'm not that interested in the virtual tabletop. Um I'm not a I'm not if I want to play a war game, I will probably play a war game. Um so I'm not that interested in that part of the, the, the virtual tabletop war gaming thing. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not that interested in miniatures in my in my D D game. So the virtual tabletop isn't a selling part for me. Um I still like physical books. Um, I'm going to be very disappointed if this is a this is a this is a way to get rid of physical books, which I kind of feel like it probably is in the long run, um, because I just don't know if there's I don't know if there's a market for physical books in. I thought I thought they mentioned it, something about the digital and physical copies going forward on some of the stuff. Oh, um, maybe I might have missed it. You can. Um, you were free to enlighten me. Uh, well, I don't necessarily want to fact. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know if I. I don't know if I have anything. But like I said, the D and D Beyond website loads so freaking slow for me that it's like I can't really look at. Uh, can't really look at anything like that. But I yeah, think I just like I said. I just um. Add something. I just don't. I don't know. Like I said, there's other games that I enjoy more. Well, and we will be exploring a lot of those other games, hopefully. Um, right. Well, that's that's the plan. But, um, but yeah, there's just I don't know. Like, um, I don't know. I think D- I think D and D is in a in a in a incredibly interesting place. That's what I think, and I think that um they're trying to go about it with as much care as they can but they're in a place where they could be um it could be out there for them it could be it could be very dangerous yeah um but and i think and i think that's what all this i think i I think that's what all this uh i keep calling a scream test i think that's what all this is about all this is about Mm -hmm. you know what what do people want um it's less about play test and more about what people want um yeah and I but think, knows? and I think that's, and I think that's the, that's the place that we're in is, uh, Hey, do you guys hate this? Do you, <laughs> well, do and, you hate, and do you hate it enough to fill out our survey? Like, that's another thing is you, you talk about people like not filling out the survey. Well, that's the thing is if they don't hate it enough to fill out the survey, then they probably don't hate it enough not to buy it. Ooh. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. It's, <laughs> it's good enough. I think um, maybe. Coming yeah, from know. the, it's like uh, it's like phone surveys uh, at, at our at our old jobs. One of the one of the two times that people will actually stay on the phone to do the phone survey, either when they're they're transcendentally happy, and are like, no, this is this is this was perfect, or they hate you, your product, and everyone involved in the company. Those are the two times that anyone will stay on the phone to do uh to do a survey and i feel like it's the same logic here um if people are really angry about it or if they want content for their website they will fill out the survey um if they're just like eh, it looks fine it'll probably still be D uh that's okay too um you know people not screaming is an answer so that's fair that's, that's my fair. two cents on it um and then, of course, there's always the moment where they can be like, well, we told you guys you could influence the game. <laughs> and you didn't take advantage of that. You, and you didn't. This uh, is your fault. Ouch. They, they turn it back on us? Wow, that's... The state of the game is your fault. <laughs> well, I mean, we just have to speak with our wallets then. Uh, but to answer your question on the digital bundles, um, they do... 
they they do have bundles that they're in the shadows of the dragon queen or shadow of the dragon queen was is the first book bundle that they're doing um where they're basically offering a physical book plus a digital copy on D&D Beyond. And because you buy it, apparently you get early access to the digital content on November 22nd. But according to the FAQ, um, they said that they are exploring that, but they're not ready to commit to every book that they they pu- they publish getting a, um, a you know physical digital bundle that goes out. Which is, I mean, weird. I mean, that's like, why wouldn't you want to commit to that? Like... <laughs> Well, because they don't want to, they don't, there's no, there's, there's, uh, physical books are hard now. Um, and it is a difficult, um, the market's difficult. Like it's hard. Physical books are something that are very hard now. Um, since COVID and everything, I've listened to several, um, book producers, uh, indie game producers. Um, and that's one of the things that they talk about is they said that, you know, it's just really, really difficult now Mm -hmm. to make games because, um, because it's, it's like, um, what am I trying to say? Brain money, money is functioning. Yeah. Because it's really hard to physically produce a book now. Like, it's really hard to like shipping is hard. Um, production is hard. Like getting printers to print the books is hard now. Um, like there's just all these factors now that are much more difficult than they were pre COVID. Um, and so that's what they're running into is just a situation where, um, you know, they can't, they just can't produce the way that they used to. So you run into these problems. Okay. Um, so physical books aren't, aren't, uh, aren't where the money is. Yeah, it's probably true. And, but, but maybe they, they can mark it up based on that though. You know, they can say, oh, well, we'll, you know, the cost of putting a, a digital copy of something isn't that bad, you know? So if they can sell something for a little bit more money and say they just, in, it's the digital bundle or whatever, who knows? Maybe but with that, I mean, that, that might be interesting. I mean, but but with that, I think we can pretty much say final verdict on one D and D or whatever the hell it is, um, you know, whatever it turns out to be in the end. I, we can pretty much say that we can't really commit to saying we're excited. I, I can't I can't commit to saying I'm excited about it. I mean, I have to, I'm kind of in a wait and see pattern in hopes that you know that maybe the feedback and their internal testing reveal that the game you know gets tweaked. I mean. I just hope that, you know, a lot of people have a lot of major complaints about the game. And if this is just window dressing on some of the, the, you know, classes and stuff like that, or they make some bare minimum changes to it in order for backwards compatibility, who knows? But I have a feeling that they're not going to be able to please everybody, but hopefully they still get a good game out of the deal. So. I have a feeling that kind of, like I said, it's going to still be D&D. So if you love D&D, I think it'll probably still be the game that you really enjoy probably true that's my that's my overall assessment of it is if you love D, you will probably love this version as much as the others because i don't think you're ever going to get uh you're never going to get a third edition again you're never going to get a fourth edition again i don't think uh i don't think they're ever going to make that mistake again as a company um well only time will tell i'm i'm i would i will bet money <laughs> bet money on that um, and I feel like that's part of what the, uh, what this whole, oh, it's playtest thing is about is, uh, trying to keep that from happening. Cause fourth edition was synonymously not, uh, popular for them. It did not work the way that I believe that they wanted it to. I probably would agree. And <laughs> cause I only bought three books. You could tell that. I mean, <laughs> three and done that's not that's not how i normally approach dnd so yeah me me either um and i bought more books than that but it still didn't uh uh it just it just missed yeah it just missed it just missed just missed so i think it i think at this point because we covered one dnd just talked about it kind of shared our thoughts fifth edition share our thoughts i mean we really reached the end and so i mean first and foremost thank you to everybody that is uh listened made it all the way to the end of the show uh we have a special thanks for you um because you actually get to hear it especially since you made it to the end uh, but we really do appreciate you taking the time to listen 
Uh, of course, you know, give us feedback. Tell us what you think of the show, how we how we did, what you would like to see, how we can improve it. And, uh, you know, we're going to do our best. So, Brent, do you have any final words for the... Uh, as always, know. everybody, as, as always, everybody, uh, roll well and roll wise and have fun playing games. Yeah. And scene. Yeah.